before I go to council comments, uh, I, I, we have uh, some uh, people uh, from UDOT here. Um, Shane doesn't know anything about UDOT, so don't ask him anything about UDOT. He didn't have a career with them. But uh, the Utah Department of Transportation is uh, a great uh, partner uh, with us in Spanish Fork City, especially at a time where we are uh, trying to, to, to figure out things of how to get people around efficiently and safely. And uh, we sure appreciate your partnership and, and being here tonight with us. Well, thank you. Um, glad to be here again, Mayor, Council. Uh, for those of you who haven't been to one of these uh, presentations before, my name is Darren Bunker. I'm a project manager at the Utah Department of Transportation. And we've been doing these little presentations uh, revolving around uh, a potential new interchange in Spanish Fork. And that the first process of getting an interchange on an interstate is to go through an environmental study. And so we, we have presented uh, a couple things in the past. Uh, in, back in November, we, we presented what we call the purpose and need of the project. And during that time, we talked about uh, three different purposes uh, and, and needs for a new interchange uh, on I-15. And those included improving the regional mobility. Uh, basically, that's um, improving access to I-15. Uh, the second um, item was to provide uh, safe and efficient access across I-15 to an intermodal or a multimodal facility. Uh, there's a subsequent study going on for uh, South Valley Transit, so a new um, light rail station uh, in the same area. And then the third and final um, objective was to improve local mobility by um, taking uh, traffic off of Main Street. And so those, that, those is what we defined as our purpose and need. Um, and since then, what we did is we went and, and based on that purpose and need, we went out and, and developed some different concepts, uh, some potential options that we have of getting an a interchange um, in the area. Um, let's see here. I think I may have lost my some of my papers. And so basically uh, what we did is um, with these alternative concepts, we, there's two levels of screening that we went through for the concepts that we came up with. Um, first, we start with several preliminary concepts that could potentially meet the purpose and need. And then we screen them down one by one um, to one or more alternatives that we evaluate in more detail uh, before making a decision. Um, at the top of this funnel, what you see is we look at the concepts related and how they relate to the purpose and need that I just described. If they don't meet that purpose and need, then we eliminate those concepts. Then we do a level two screening, uh, and we look at a high level uh, analysis of how the remaining options could uh, meet the project's purpose and we look at the results of additional impacts to key resources in this, in this level. Concepts that pass through both these levels of screening are then developed so that we can evaluate the benefits and impacts in more detail. Um, let's see here. So this was the result of the level one screening. As you can see here, we evaluated five different locations for an interchange. Uh, one at 400 North, one at Center Street, one at uh, 100 South, 900 South, and then we had a unique concept where we actually would split the interchange into two structures, which is what we call the split interchange. And so that in that case, we would have uh, a structure at Center Street and also another structure at 1500 West. Okay, and so those are the those are the locations. Uh, and so this table shows the results. The colors on this table represent the options that performed uh, worst uh, among all the options. And those are highlighted in red, and then those options that performed uh, best, and those options are, are shown in green. Um, we measured how well, a, for example, over on the left-hand side under regional mobility, we measured how well a particular concept would uh, get vehicles uh, to the to the off of the Main Street interchange and the ben Benjamin interchange. So that's what we're talking about when we talk about regional mobility. Okay, as you can see here, 
uh, the 400 North interchange performed the worst. In other words, it, did, it didn't attract uh, enough vehicles to the new interchange. We can see that the splitter interchange in this case performed the best, okay? Um, and, and we've got the data there that shows how that breaks out. Um, for uh, multimodal facilities, we evaluated how well the particular option would get people across I-15 to the planned improvements and, and the requirements for uh, the new light rail that is planned to come in. In this case, you can see that uh, interchanges at 400 north and 900 south are not consistent with the approved plans because they are farther away from Center Street, which is where the proposed location is for the uh, front runner station. And um, the interchange at Center Street or 100 south would be the best locations to provide access to, to that front runner station. Moving on to local mobility, um, we measured how well the concept would improve uh, local mobility by the number of vehicles that it would remove from Main Street. Uh, an interchange at 900 South it performed the, um, the poorest in that case, um, in that it would only take about 8.2% of the traffic off of Main Street. Whereas you can see the split interchange uh, would remove 19% of the traffic off of Main Street. So, Based on level one screening, which is this table here, uh, we, we eliminated the options of 400 north and 900 south. We eliminated 400 north because it did not attract enough vehicles from adjacent interchanges to support regional mobility, and it did not provide good connectivity across I-15 to the planned transit station. We eliminated 900 south because it did not attract enough vehicles off Main Street to support local mobility. And so it did not provide good connectivity across I-15 either. In summary, uh, three of these interchange concepts passed the level one screening. And that would be the Center Street interchange, the uh, 100 South interchange, and the split interchange. Hey, Darren, so, can I interrupt you real quick? Sure. Um, these are 2050 numbers? These, these numbers are based on 2050 traffic, 2050. yeah. On the local mobility one, the 49,000 is an additional, what is the, what does 49,000 mean? Uh, the 29,000? 49. Oh, the, the 49. The no action. Oh, no action. So, so that means that in, in 2050, there will be 49,000 more vehicles going down Main Street. Okay, so we do they, nothing, there'll be almost 50,000 more cars on our Main Street. If one of these other alternatives were implemented, there'd be 19% less than that. Correct. I thought we'd that. Okay. Thank you. So these next slides we're going to go over, we're going to go over the level two screening process for the remaining three options, okay? This is, uh, and, and hopefully you guys can, can see this and kind of visualize maybe even in 3D uh, what, this, what we're talking about here, but this is the 100 South concept, meaning an interchange at 100 South, okay? So in this case, uh, we would be building a, a, an elevated structure over I-15, so we would have to lower I-15, build an overpass over I-15. That overpass would also go over the railroad track. We would move the railroad track to the west uh, so that we could accommodate the interchange and the new station. And then um, as part of this concept, we would also have to improve the 100 South Corridor. And I'll get into the impacts of that in a little bit, but um, uh, this particular uh, concept uh, or option had the most impacts to property. Um, let's see here. This and so this concept was eliminated because of those high impacts uh, to to uh, to properties, both residential and uh, commercial. Okay, so this one did not move forward. Um, this is the split interchange, what we call split interchange here. As you can see, as I explained before, there's two, actually two structures here. One structure at Center Street and another structure at 1550 West. So if you're heading north on I-15, you'd actually get off at 1550 West, um, off that exit, and you would travel on a one-way frontage road on the east side of I-15 up till you got to Center Street. And then that's where the entrance ramp would be to get back onto I-15. 
So there's kind of a gap in between those two structures where you have these one-way one uh, roads uh, that take traffic from one structure to the next structure, okay? Um, this particular interchange had uh, more impacts to uh, the environment, uh, to what we call 4F properties, uh, which are federally protected uh, resources. Um, and so because of the significant amount of impact, uh, this concept was also eliminated. Which leaves us with the Center Street concept. The Center Street concept is what um, um, Spanish Fork has actually been working on for several years. Um, and we're grateful for the, as I mentioned before, the work that has been done prior to uh, this environmental study kicking off by uh, Spanish Fork staff. Um, but there's a little variance in, in what we came up with uh, versus what was in the original scoping report. That is that we looked at, um, lower again, lowering I-15 um, and, and taking 100 south over I-15. Currently, if you go on 100 south, it goes under I-15, okay? I'm, I'm sorry, Center Street. Well, actually, Center Street doesn't go across. But in this area, um, 100 south, I-15 goes over 100 south. So with this concept, we would have to lower I-15, okay? <coughs> Um, and then in our concept study, we actually looked at closing 100 south across I-15. And I'll get to a little bit of that in a, a little bit later. Um, in this case, the rail line would also have to be shifted to the west. And um, this concept did pass the screening, level two screening. It did meet the purpose and need from level one. And it also uh, met the level two screening because it uh, had the fewest impacts and the lowest cost. So this is the concept. We're gonna move forward into the next phase of the study, which is to get into a detailed analysis of this particular option. Okay, and so in summary for level two screening, this is what it looks like. For aquatic resources, uh, which include rivers and ditches and canals, those types of things, and for uh, section 4F, which is historic home sites, sometimes they can be historic canals as well. Um, the split interchange, although it performed the best in terms of uh, moving traffic off of Main Street, uh, the regional mobility issues, it performed the worst uh, in terms of uh, meeting the, the other criteria that we have to, have to look at, the aquatic resources and so forth. And so because of this, uh, the split interchange was eliminated. And um, also when you look at 100 South, when you look at the property impacts, that's why we eliminated that particular option because we're looking at 33 uh, relocations in that case. Along, along, along the Center Street corridor. Yeah. From south. Okay. Because right now that Center Street, I'm, I'm sorry, the 100 South corridor. Okay. The 100 South corridor is currently only two lanes, whereas the Center Street corridor is already kind of built out, so there's a lot fewer impacts. And so that, that's why we're gonna move forward with this Center Street interchange. Um, and so now uh, our next step is to take this Center Street interchange concept and get in and refine the design. And as part of that um, refinement, we are also, we're looking at an option where we don't have to close 100 South. If you remember, I said during the screening process, we assumed 100 South would be closed with this option. Now that we're into the refinement uh, part of the process, we're going to look and see if we can't keep 100 South open. Uh, potentially using 100 South as a, as a multi-use uh, pathway um, across I-15. Uh, we're, we're trying to avoid having the multi-use uh, traffic go across the, a spooey, right? You, you can imagine wheelchairs, bicycles, joggers trying to get across a spooey interchange. So we're looking at the possibility of using the 100 South corridor as a way for to accommodate multimodal use. Okay. Um, so this is where we are. We're, our current phase is the alternative evaluation. Uh, as I said, we're gonna refine the alternatives and 
through this process, we'll come up with a preferred alternative. So the preferred alternative will either be um, a, an interchange at Center Street or no action, meaning we wouldn't do a project. Um, and I think you could kind of imagine from a few previous slides the, the question that Shane asked in terms of the traffic on Main Street, getting people across I-15, um, the, the interchange option has a pretty high likelihood of, of outperforming the no action. Um, and so this shows us your schedule. We, we plan on having this part of the phase done um, here in about May. And in that time, we will produce a document that describes our preferred alternative. And then we'll open up our decision to a public comment period, a 30-day co public comment period, after which that closes, we'll address all the public comments that we get uh, from that process. And then finally, we'll respond to those and plan on um, uh, putting out a final decision in the November timeframe on, on this. And, and th at that point, the study will be complete. So anyway, uh, that's our update for today. Uh, again, this is how you can contact us. Um, these are on, on multiple places uh, in, on the Spanish Fork website, on UDOT's website. Feel free to give us a call whenever you want, and I'll open it up to questions. Thank you, Darren. We got Mr. Bunker here from UDOT. Any questions uh, from the council? Why are y'all looking at me? Oh, I just, you, you, I, I, I would just, I, you knew I was going to go, right? Yeah. Um, I would just say, I don't know if it's a question as much as a, um, a supportive comment to looking at 100 South as a multi use um, pedestrian corridor. Um, getting people out of those buoys is really important. Um, not a place to walk, not a place to bike. Um, so I would be super supportive of moving in that direction. I think it's a great, great option, even if it was just a trail over I-15. Um, even if you took the traffic off of it, I still think it would be a better solution than, right. than putting people through the spooey. So I like that idea a lot. Maybe um, give an example to the public of what a spooey is. Uh, the University Parkway on I-15. 400, 400 south in Springville. Springville. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's closer. Yeah, that one there. My Thanks, question Dan. on that is you, you're changing the elevation so you'd no longer go under on 100 South, you'd go, you'd go over the freeway? Yeah, so as I mentioned, the, the, the current design through the, the, the concept phase was that we would be at grade, the same grade as the railroad track, which would mean we'd have to close uh, the 100 South crossing. Now, through this refinement process, we're looking at um, actually being at grade at Center Street and then elevating by the time we get to 100. So you're still going to... We, we would still go over 100. You'd go over 100, but the issue with us crossing at 100 South is there's a railroad still there. That, right, that and, I, I, and I forgot to mention that we're looking at keeping 100 South open. However, you do have the UTA project, the, the front runner station. They could come back in their study and say, no, we need to close that crossing. Um, crossings um, in, around a multimodal facility like a, a transit station um, is, is not the ideal situation, right? And so anytime that those types of projects can close an at-grade crossing, that's what they prefer. And so although we may, we may come out with a concept that keeps it open, they could come back and say, we need to close it. So no guarantees. Yeah. I thought crossings were easy. Jared Johnson said crossings are easy to Very get easy. across. Road. Darren, if you, if you do an, if you keep the crossing for trails and whatnot, would you, you'd go under with the trail, but it doesn't have the same height clearances as vehicular, vehicular yeah. traffic. So right? in case of the multimodal trail part of that equation, we would go under um, I-15 and then we would we would turn and go back towards Center Street between the yeah. railroad track and the freeway. Right. And we would climb back up to the level of okay. where the spooey would be and provide a nice access across the railroad and then back down into uh, the transit station. Yeah. Seems like a great, a great option to study. Thanks for yeah, being so thoughtful of that. <clears throat> so one thing that came up when we started this study is timelines, right? We talked about timeline for this part of it. Can you just give a rough estimate how after this part of the study is done, when the next actions would take place? Because people get uh, want to know, like, when would they see action on that? And I know it's a little while out there, but. So that will all depend on, on how the funding is achieved. 
um, and there's several ways that the, the project can get funded. The most typical way is through a through what we call a STIP process. So the project goes on a on a like a prioritization list, and it gets funded through um, regular monies. Um, other other avenues are through legislative action, um, and those are those. That's a particular item that UDOT doesn't get involved in. That's typically done through a, a political route. Uh, and so I don't have an answer to that question because um, I'm, I'm not privy to the discussions that are happening in, in, that, in that realm. Perfect, thank you. So realistically, in the fall, you've got details and, and pictures that says this is what we're going yeah, for. Yeah, this is, here's, this here's is what we're, we're thinking would serve the community the best, that would, that would fulfill the purpose and need and, and get, the, get the mobility that you're looking for. And a financial attachment to it. Of there would be a fi- yeah, there will be a financial attachment to it. Right, and that financial attachment will look at, for example, the 100 South Crossing. Mm-hmm. It'll look at potentially having to build a new uh, structure on 100 South to either accommodate um, vehicle traffic and 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 uh, multi-use tr- uh, trail, or just a multi-use trail, depending on what happens out of the UTA study. But it'll include uh, a budget for all of that. Yep. And maybe just putting a pin in that, th- th- those dollars are typically much larger than just a city coming up with uh, the, the, the dollars for that. These it are projects be, yeah. <laughs> that, uh, that are statewide. Yeah. Typically, there, there's help needed in that regard, yeah. So, Darren, just um, big picture, you mentioned two ways of funding. The first one was the normal UDOT process. Isn't it, it seems like UDOT's funded currently out to about 2030 at this point. So there's no room between now and 2030 at the very least in the normal process. It would be post-2030 at best. Correct. Um, so, so part of the STIP process, if you go out to the uh, Mountain Land Association of Governments website, they do have um, the, the long-range plan out there. And they've broken it out into three phases, right? Um, phase one goes from uh, 2023 to 2033, I think now. Uh, they just updated it. And then phase two goes from 2033 to 2043. So they're broken out, broken out in 10-year segments. I believe that this interchange is on their phase one uh, program. And so they have allocated some money, but typically these types of projects are, are large enough that there's additional monies that are needed to complete it. That's good to know. Good but it is, it, is, it is an anticipated project on the STIP. Darren, you're over our, our region. That's a, a much broader area than, than just us, uh, even though we feel we're the most important. But uh, we appreciate you uh, doing this for, for uh, many cities and in, in, in the broad area that it is uh, and your working relationship with us. Anything that you want the <coughs> citizens of Spanish Fork to know besides scan the QR code and, and the, uh, uh, continue the process? The of The US-6 project from I-15. Yeah to the mouth of Spanish Fork Canyon is kicking off. You've probably seen the construction starting out there. Um, Phase one of the Springville Spanish Fork interchange has also started to kick off. Um, And then we just uh, let phase two of that project, which is is basically the majority of of the interchange, uh, we're letting that out um, to bid uh, at the end of the month. And so you'll see some significant activity uh, regarding that interchange happening by the, by the end of the year as well. So a lot of, a lot of roadway work going on in, in your community that will significantly impact um, how your community gets around. So well, this is works. great feedback because I know our residents' primary concern in Spanish work right now is traffic. So you being here and giving us all this feedback is so helpful because it's none of this is in our hands up here. It's in your hands. So... We're happy to do it anytime you want us to give you an update. We're, we're happy to come and share. Thank you. Just doing some rough numbers in my head. Those those projects, citizens, I think Councilwoman Beck touched on it. We, we hear you. Traffic is a pain for all of us. It's a pain for any growing community. It's a pain for us. We live, we live next to you, so we get it as well. But the result of that is listening and, and, and partnering with projects like this we're well into the hundreds of millions of projects that are under construction in, in, in our area that will directly affect your life once they're complete as far as traffic 
uh, going. I mean, I think half a billion is not not a stretch by any means when you when you count in that Springle exit and our Highway Six project. It's a lot of money, and uh, and so your council is advocating for you during the legislative session and beyond, and, and UDOT uh, is a great partner to have there. So thank you so much, Darren. Thank you. Thanks, Darren. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.